This is Gerald Frost, and I'm going to be reading to you um, Avian Aliens, a uh, dream sequence um, from a book that I'm writing. I'm not sure that I'm going to include it, but it's kind of cool. So here we go. Avian Aliens. Some called the newcomers chickens. Some called them eagles. They were an avian species with the intelligence of a janitor, or so the derision goes. They'd certainly cleaned our clocks and anything that involved flight. Under the trees, they were awkward. But in the open air, they were superior. On the ground, we humans dominated. Underground, their brains short-circuited. They weren't designed for enclosed spaces. They'd come here in spaceships, but they weren't designed for enclosed spaces. <laughs> Go figure. They had come to ground some... They had to come to ground sometime, didn't they? We'd learned from each other. They learned to make personal tanks, which meant we had to hit them with something better than lead-filled slam shot. They learned how to get around in slightly faster than we ground-born could, so running was a lousy option. We learned to be afraid of them. I was out of ammo, and I was the only military person with a dozen fleeing civilians trekking across the Russian countryside. We ran. We hid in hand-dug caves that previous comrades had hacked-slash-dug into the ground-slash-boulder slopes of ancient moraines. Safe houses, they were called. Others called them death traps. They were barely deep enough into a hill to hold all of us. I made it a point to push my civvies to dig each artificial cave a few more inches back into the ground, in part for the safety for the next crew, and in part to give them something distracting to do barely good enough to invade the heat-seeking mode that the chickens had learned from us. The avian didn't have visual heat sensitivity built into their eyes, but when they saw how we did it, it didn't take them long to duplicate the technology. The chickens on the ground weren't very smart or very creative, but somewhere in the background there were some smart bird brains, smart enough to mimic the technology of the planet they were conquering. The consensus was that they were genetically modified even though under interrogation, well, torture, the hawks themselves didn't even know for sure. The earliest memories were of a nest with hundreds of eggs and a single adult caretaker. The caretaker would help with the hatching, cleaning up the shell fragments and herding the young into the next room. From there, it was two years of training classes, and most didn't even remember their own hatching. As I said, I was fleeing with twelve civilians. I hadn't lost any though I valued my own skin above the whole set. I'd come across a patrol of chicken hawks a couple of hours back, and I did what I had to do. They were surprised, and they were out of their vehicles, and what I will write up as a glorious victory was actually a slaughter of soldiers that were chatting over dinner. I guess no one told them to leave a guard in the vehicles. This squad of squabs wouldn't learn, but maybe the news of fantastic fighting formations would leak back into the brains of their smart birds and from there to their leaders. You know, even when you think you're safe, guard your perimeter from those freaky feces-flinging monkeys. That sort of thing is second nature to human soldiers, buried so deep in our genetics that if a squad leader doesn't order perimeter protection, his leadership is challenged both from above and below. As I looked over the bloody bodies of the fallen avian soldiers, I quipped in Russian, for the sake of the locals I was escorting. Delicious and nutritious. Tastes like chicken. None of them even smiled. I thought it was a wickedly funny joke, but it fell flat on this audience. As I said, I was out of ammunition. I pushed the avian air sleds into a pile, threw the feathered bodies onto the pile, poured their own fuel on them, and set a time charge. When we were a mile away, the detonation moved the asset from the useful column into the column marked beyond hope of repair. A part of me believes that the avian leadership views equipment as more valuable than the soldiers using it. I might be wrong, but metal takes mining and processing, with the important bit being the mining. That would happen at the start and the end of a 10,000 year long journey. Some of the metal would have been... Some of the metal would have been scavenged from their invasion fleet. Part was likely from our own moon. Part of that smoke would have been atoms derived from avian galaxy ships, matter that had been lifted out of avian gra gravity wells. 
Harvesting their hearts and hardware made me smile. Petty, I know, but I'll take my victories wherever I can find them. We trekked across hills so rock-bound that trees couldn't gain root. We dashed through forest of three-foot-tall trees that offered no protection to a running man. And we ran through deep forest where the trees that now grew were outnumbered by the dust-blasted crop circles, places where nothing grew. I wanted cover from the sky. The avian had made sure that there was a frustrating lack of what I wanted. The enemy had that principle down to the bone. There was lots of running, even when there was nothing following. Eventually, we wound up in a clearing, a bit of level land surrounded by trees, where once a farm had managed to scrape out an existence. Now we could only tell someone had lived there because there was a section of corrugated roof that had blown off a barn and the foundational outline of where a house had been. Once it, its inhabitants sang happy peasant songs and dreamed of life in the big city. Now those dreams were dead. Weeds grew over them. No happy songs today. Even I was out of breath, and I was hardened to running with a pack. Didn't like it, but I was able to do it when I needed to. The civilians following me? I've no idea how they were keeping up with the death pace I was setting. But now we were out of options. I heard another patrol ahead, and there was only one place to hide. Under the dis detached scalp of roof, we scrambled. I watched as a scan beam swept the area. There was no sound. Well, wind in the trees and the nervous farts from my civilians. But there was no sound from the scan. I mentally edited it in. Purp, purp, suit, purp. Again, with the humor of a dead man. If I lived through this, I might ask a professional, preferably over alcohol. I knew it was some sort of coping mechanism, and I didn't care. We were spotted, and there was no way we were going to live out the hour. There was no way an editor would yell at me for my sentence fragments. Hell, I could probably hold my breath longer than I expected to live. I threw my gun out and waited. A single chicken hawk came into view. I could see it between the ground and the last wooden rafter still attached to the metal, a wide horizontal window that revealed death coming my way on fowl's legs. With that strangely shaped gun that they carry below their right wing, a breastplate protector, a helmet, and a backpack. Death didn't carry a scythe anymore. He carried precision ballistics and collected human souls with a pooper scooper. It scanned the area and advanced. Three steps to the right, four steps to the left always closing the distance. Was this part of the avian brain, or had they adopted the sidel from the fact that our from the fact that excessive and erratic lateral movement confused our automatic defenses? If I had a single shot, I'd have pulled the trigger on the second side step, and I'd be winner winner, chicken dinner. But no. Side note, our ammunition didn't fit their guns, nor did their ammunition fit our guns. Neither species could use the weapons or anim ammo scavenged from the opposing soldiers in the field. My weapon was intentionally discarded. Our last hope was to become prisoners. Better a living dog than a dead lion, or so the saying went. Some may disagree. Many disagree. He who fights and runs away, went the rebel mantra. Scant comfort. We were breathing our last, and we knew it. The avian approached and stopped. A device extended with clicks from its backpack. One metal claw was planted flat on the ground, and another claw grew upward. It curved back down, gripped the roof we hid under, and lifted. I beat twelve of their soldiers. That was glorious, never mind the details. This chicken was going to kill a dozen civilians and a single soldier. In my mind, live or die. I'd already won. Slowly, the roof creaked upward. It tilted open by an amazing bit of backpack technology. In the way of dead men everywhere, I wondered about the physics of lifting that much weight. How big were the batteries in the bird's backpack? What sort of nanomolecular nonsense was I witnessing? If their frontline soldiers could use it, surely I should be able to understand it or, failing that, have it slowly and patiently explained to me by videos made by an intelligent scientist. As it was, Big Bird was doing magic for the monkeys. The avian examined us. 
It tilted its head down, back and forth, and up again. Down, back and forth, and up again. Five times it repeated the same set of moves. Finally it spoke. My orders. Examine metal hiding place in field. Kill hostile elements. I knew what it was saying, because my scientists had equipped me with a translator. Granted, it was primarily used for um, interrogation, but it was normally pretty accurate. I'd run tests on it, doing noun verification and such. There were different dialects among the avian, though they all spoke the same root language. I knew what it said. I didn't respond, because initiating conversation was considered, by the avian, an aggressive, dominant act. This one hadn't asked me a question. I stayed mute, because the law of averages suggested that this was a good thing to do. The civilians behind me? They stayed quiet because this was so weird to them, they didn't know what to say. I find no weapons among them. I carry the only weapon. Conclusion. I am the hostile element, said my translation. The avian was actually squawking. The correct response is... And here the boy bird pointed its own gun at its own head, and it did whatever they do to pull the trigger. Now me, if I was an avian scientist, I'd have put some sort of failsafe, something that fed back to the firing mechanism that it wouldn't shoot fellow soldiers, especially not the damn bird carrying the weapon. With the head gone, without feedback, the roof fell back to the ground where it had been. Because no one had moved, no one was hurt. I crawled out. My civilians crawled out, too. We stood there and, in effect, paid homage to a fallen soldier. Delicious and nutritious, I said in Russian. Tastes like chicken, the civilians intoned in monotone unison. I stripped him of his weapons, backpack, and chest armor, and they were dropped in the muddy stream. They'd be tracked, and the mud couldn't be any fun for an avian to dig through, especially when they didn't know if they were being watched through a sniper scope. One of my civilians tossed the helmet in, far downstream. I hadn't seen that being scavenged. I grunted as much praise as I could afford. We hustled down along the muddy stream and crossed when we had the stones. Into the trees we vanished. Such cover speaks to my monkey brain, and the people that I led without caring about. I wonder, as... I run, if such angst is common among the avian ranks. Interesting data. This will be passed up the chain of command. Eventually, my headset video will reach the computers of the scientists who are working to decipher the psychology of the chicken hawks. How else can they project demoralizing propaganda? Your leaders strut, but in private they take it in the butt. It's the kind of nonsense that people who polish their chairs with their arses are so keen about. But to the soldier in the field the schmuck who's risking his life on the orders of leaders he's never seen and never will. It makes a difference. My orders are to get these people to safety. They're good people, and they seem like good orders to me. I think an unsoldierly thought. What would I do if I thought they were bad orders? I put the thought out of my mind. Scanning for danger and better paths and keeping these people safe is enough to consume all of my mental effort. I wake up. What was that all about? Okay, that's what I've got. Leave me a comment or two. What do you think? Um, I think it needs a bit more description. I think it has too much um, uh, telling what's going on rather than describing what's going on. That's, But this is first pass, so yeah, that's kind of normal. All right. Thanks for listening.